Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Granada Forum on February 1st, 2007. I want to introduce a wonderful man, a man who's a doctor, a man who wrote a book which is famous called The Brotherhood of Darkness. He specializes in talk radio and interviewing all kinds of things on the New World Order. So without any further ado, let me bring this wonderful guest, Mr. Dr. Stanley Monteith. Reality is usually scoffed at. Illusion is usually king. But in the battle for survival of Christian civilization, it's going to be reality, not illusion or delusion, that will determine what the future will bring. I begin my radio programs five hours every day with that statement, but it's really very, very true today. Because the great problem we have today is most people really have no grasp of what's going on in the world. Now, most people believe that we have freedom of the press and freedom of speech. But the truth of the matter is uh, that most of the things that are going on today are little known to the average individual, for there is a secret. In fact, it has been said that an understanding of the forces that shape the events of the 20th century and are shaping the events of this century is predicated not upon facts to be learned, but rather upon secrets to be discovered. Now, let me simply give you an example. I assume most people here in the audience today are fairly well informed. But how many of you know what Operation Keel Hall was? Everybody here within, uh, certainly uh, in, who's going to be watching this program is, has heard of the, uh, the Holocaust and the tragic death of six million Jews during the Second World War. But how many people have heard about Operation Keel Hall when at the end of the Second World War uh, there were approximately six million Russians who had either defected to the Nazis or been captured by the Nazis and were held at the end of the Second World War in prison camps uh, in Europe. England, Canada, and the United States. And they were rounded up then at the end of the Second World War and at Bayonet Point, forced to return to Russia to be killed. Two million of them were immediately killed. Two million more were sent to Siberia where they were worked to death. And two million uh, could never once again get a job or own a piece of property in Russia. Uh, they became the faceless, nameless people there. Uh, a perfect example of the fact that there was no escape from Soviet tyranny. Everybody in Russia knew about Operation Keel Hall. Nobody in America knows about it. Now, if you want to verify it, uh, today, why, well, you can go up on the internet and look up Operation Keel Hall. Figures often used as two million, but the figure was really uh, almost six million, as verified by a man named Tolstoy, uh, who is Tolstoy's, the famous Tolstoy of War and Peace fame's nephew, a uh, book by Julius Epstein uh, called Operation Keel Hall, another book called East Came West, but you can verify this up on the internet today. And yet we never talk about the death of almost six million people here in America today under Operation Keel Hall. How many people know about Operation Paperclip? We're at the end of the Second World War. Why the uh, Nazis, those wicked Nazis, thousands of the scientists were brought here to the United States to work on our space program, to work on psychological programs, mind control programs, and biological warfare, creating new and terrible diseases, some of which plague our population today. And then, of course, 10,000 of the most vicious of the Nazi war criminals were helped to escape to South America by something called the Rat Line under Operation Paperclip, mediated by the CIA and MI6. Martin Bormann, Dr. Mengele, Klaus Barbie, and uh, many of the other vicious Nazi names uh, that we uh, remember. 10,000, we helped them escape, and most of them lived out their lives comfortably in South America. How could you conceal something like that from the American people? How many Americans have ever heard of the fact that at the end of the Second World War, we abandoned between 20 and 25,000 American soldiers to die and in Siberia, not one of them was ever released. 
our government knew about it and abandoned them there. That's covered in the Helms Committee report, which we have, came out of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, not a mention of that in the media. How many Americans have heard of the Great Hunger? We're between 1958 and 1962 in China. The regime that we had brought to power there uh, when we uh, toppled the regime of Chiang Kai-shek and brought the communists to power in 1949, that between 1958 and 1962, the communist government starved to death uh, between 41 and 43 million people. You can go up on the internet and look it up. Uh, they re usually use the figure 30 million, but the actual figure, according to Stephen Mosier, who, uh, who got the figures from the communist officials was between 41 and 43 million people. How could you cover up the intentional killing of between 41 and 43 million people? Why reality is usually scoffed at. Illusion is usually king. But in the battle for the survival of Christian civilization. It's going to be reality, not illusion or delusion that will determine what the future will bring. And our job is to try to get people to understand what is really going on in the world today. So to give you some idea of a background and frame of, frame of mind, I'd like to give you the opening words of one of the greatest books of modern time. It was written by Charles Dickens. It was called The Tale of Two Cities. It was the story of the French Revolution. And this is what he said. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of reason. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the time of light. It was the time of darkness. It was, it was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. And of course, this was the story of the French Revolution. And the French Revolution was the first in a series of revolutions that have continued since that time. Now, the one thing about the opening is the opposites, almost as if there's a duality. In other words, as if there are two pigeons. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of reason. It was, it was the age of foolishness. And if you study what's going on in the world today, you realize that this duality is really is the predominant force within our world today. Some of us believe one thing, others know the truth. Because indeed there is a secret. It has been passed down through the generations, but very, very few know what it's about. Probably the best book on the French Revolution and this world revolution that we speak of was written by James H. Billington, who, for many years, head of the Smithsonian Institute, and is today the Librarian of Congress. Now, his book, Fire in the Minds of Men, is a classic. In fact, if you read President Bush's 2005 inaugural speech, he talks about the fire in the minds of men, how it, how it warms those who, who seek after freedom and how it burns those who oppose it. Why was he referring to this book, Fire in the Minds of Men, this idea? Well, what, what James H. Billington tells us in this book uh, is that there is a world revolution. It began with the French Revolution. Actually, of course, he leaves off the American Revolution, which was the first in a series of revolutions that first of all shook Europe, and then, of course, destabilized France repeatedly and Germany and Italy. And then after the First World War, led to the German Revolution and the destruction of the German Empire, the destruction of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the destruction of the Ottoman Empire, the destruction of the Russian Empire, and established communism in Russia. And then after the Second World War, it led to the revolution in China and the revolution in Cuba. And you cannot understand anything going on today unless you understand there is a continuing revolution. Now, the book uh, Fire in the Minds of Men was written in 1980. The year before that, of course, we had three great revolutions. We had one in Nicaragua that displaced the sand and the, the uh, uh, existing government of Somoza and put in the Sandinista a communist regime and was mediated by your government. There was another in Iran 
where they overthrew the Shah of Iran and installed the, the mullahs, who were now we seem to be in confrontation with. At least that would be a, the appearance of what's going on. And then, of course, uh, there was a revolution in Iraq. And a man named Saddam Hussein came to power. And if you think Saddam Hussein could have come to power without the full help and support of the American Central Intelligence Agency, you do not understand what is driving the world revolution today. And just last year, we completed another revolution as we bucked the communist regime that has taken over in Nepal, the Maoist regime that's taken over in Nepal. But we're so fixated upon what's going on in the Middle East today, most people are totally unaware of the revolution that occurred last year in Nepal, as nation after nation after nation is prepared for the ultimate goal, that age-old plan of a new world order and a new world religion. Well, to understand really what's going on today in the world, uh, we really need to take you back to a talk and to a story I've told many times. And you've probably heard me tell this story that was written 350 or more years before Christ was born in Bethlehem. It, it was an allegory, really. It's one of the most famous stories ever written. It was the story of a group of men and women who'd been taken captive and been taken into a gigantic cave where for many years they were kept in chains. Chains so that their backs were towards the center of the cavern, their faces were towards the wall of the cavern. And there, in the center of the cavern, they burned an eternal flame, an eternal fire. Now, that flame then would cast shadows on the wall of the cave. And the people there in their chains, all they could see was the dancing shadows on the wall of the cave. At times, why their, their captors would make humorous shadows, and those would be projected upon the wall of the cave. And the people would laugh because it was, it was funny. Other times, it'd be frightening shadows. The people would, would cringe in terror and fear because that was the reality. Simply the dancing shadows on the wall of the cave. And then one day, one of their group broke loose from his chains, and he went out, and he saw reality. He saw the sun and the stars and the brooks and the trees and what the world was really like, and he went back into the cave, and he broke his fellows loose from their chains and tried to lead them into reality. But as they approached the mouth of the cave, the light blinded them, and they turned back. Now, this story is known as the parable of the cave. And it was written by Plato. You'll find it in his Republic. It is one of the more famous things he's ever written. And the interpretation of this that most people would have is that life really hasn't changed very much since those days. Our reality is what we are allowed to see. We see the dancing shadows, and that becomes our reality. Certainly most people who've studied what goes on in America realize that the media is controlled. And if you can suppress the story of Operation Keel Hall and Operation Paperclip and the great hunger and the murder, the starving to death of between 41 and 43 million people in China, some people say it's only 30 million, well, 30 million, 43 million, every one of them is a unique individual, human being, made in the image and likeness of God. I mean, how could you suppress things like that? Very simply, the media is controlled. And so our reality is what we're allowed to hear and see. And as we turn on our television sets, as we listen to talk radio, our minds are being shaped, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. That quotation comes from Edward Bernay, the father of modern day uh, uh, propaganda in his book, I think in 1928, called Propaganda. But it is really so true. Our, we are governed, our minds are molded, our, our uh, tastes are formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. And so that's the interpretation that I've had for many years, the parable of the cave. But recently, I've come to realize there's another interpretation, far more pointed, far more important, and far more applicable to an understanding of unfolding events today. Now, to really begin to understand what's going on, you have to understand uh, the writings of a man named Leo Strauss and the teachings of a man named Professor Leo Strauss at the University of Chicago. And Leo Strauss 
um, is to, was the, really the father of modern-day neoconservatism. So the neoconservatives or the neocons run the Bush administration today and have taken us into another no-win war uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I say this is a no-win war uh, because, well, let me give you an example. During the first Gulf War in 1991, the president's father, George Herbert Walker Bush, amassed an army of 695,000 men, not to engage Saddam Hussein's troops, but just to shoo them out of Kuwait. We didn't try to go in and take Kuwait. 695,000 troops did a pretty good job. Now, is it reasonable to think, is it reasonable to think that, you know, with uh, certainly, uh, uh, the present invasion of Iraq, which was carried out in, uh, in March of 2003, that we would send 160,000 men to do the job uh, that 695,000 men didn't even attempt to do 10, uh, 12 years earlier? Why would we send 695,000 men just to shoo the troops out of Kuwait and then only send 160,000 men, then reduce now to 140,000, although we, we are going to surge the number. We're not going to increase the number. We're going to surge the number. It's amazing how they use words to deceive people. Uh, and nobody ever comments, why don't they just say increase the number of troops? Well, we're going to surge the number of troops. Uh, you know, why would we think that 160,000 men are going to do a better job than, uh, than 140,000 troops? I mean, if you really wanted to do the job, you'd send in a million-man army, and you'd put the whole country under martial law, and that would be the end of it. And you'd maintain it until you could establish a stable government. But we've already decided we weren't going to. We invaded in March of 2003. By the end of, by the 1st of April, why we had secured the country, we were in total charge. And the military, our military, are good men. They really believe in what they're doing. And they, they wanted simply to turn the country back over to the Iraqis. And then Paul Bremer arrives. Paul Bremer, who works for Henry Kissinger, work, has worked for Henry Kissinger, is part of the elite group that controls this country. And there is an elite group that controls the country that are unelected. And Paul Bremer, over the objection of the American commanders, disbands the Iraqi army, disbands the Iraqi police force, disbands the Iraqi civil service, closes all the factories that are giving employment to people. There were a number of them that were run by the government. He said, oh, you don't want government-run factories. You want them bought up by private enterprise because private enterprise will do a better job. But what private individual is going to buy a closed factory with no employees? He closed them down, fired all the employees, nothing to go, and to this date, most of those factories have never opened again. Now, I want you to know Paul Bremer is one of the most brilliant men in America. Do you honestly believe he made a mistake? No, they don't make mistakes. They know what they're doing. They did not want a stable Iraq. They wanted the chaos, and they've managed to create chaos. And the president repeatedly denies we have a civil war. But we have a civil war there. The president insists we're winning. We're not winning. The president insists we're fighting terrorism over there. This war has nothing to do with fighting terrorism. I mean, uh, certainly Iraq had nothing to do with 911. We're not fighting terrorism. We're recruiting people into the terrorist cause by being there. And we're fighting another no-win war. We could even better exemplify that in Afghanistan, where our troops today are fighting the Taliban. Who are the Taliban? Well, the original term referred to students, and they were Pakistanis who were funded uh, by Saudi Arabia and by Pakistani intelligence, the ISI, as they are still funded by the ISI today. They operate openly, they train openly, they are armed openly in Pakistan, and then they move northward into Afghanistan to kill American soldiers. Then they retreat back into Afghanistan. And who funds Pakistani intelligence? Why, the American CIA. So we fund the people who fund the people, who fund the Taliban that are killing our soldiers. It's Vietnam all over again. 
And if you go into the story of Vietnam and you get my material on Vietnam, you'll find that all during the Vietnam War, we funded the Russians who funded the North Vietnamese who killed our boys in South Vietnam. We were not allowed to win the war in Vietnam. We could have won it in two months at any time. I was told that personally by Ambassador Sullivan, William H. Sullivan, the ambassador to Laos, and by uh, General Lou Walter Four, a star marine general. We could have won it in two months. We were never allowed to win the war in Vietnam, and we're not being allowed to win the war in Afghanistan or in Iran today, and nobody wants to say that. Because, you see, reality is usually scoffed at. Illusion is usually king. But in the battle for survival of Western civilization, it will be reality, not illusion or delusion, that will determine what the future will bring. Well, Professor Leo Strauss at the University of Chicago was the father of the modern-day neoconservative movement, and Professor Leo Strauss uh, taught his, his pupils all about Plato. And you remember, of course, Plato had written the parable of the cave. And Plato is pivotal to an understanding of everything going on today. Plato's Republic really talked about this idea of creating an ideal or utopian society ruled by a so-called just man. And they were going to have this utopian society, and, and this was, of course, going to solve all the problems of humanity. And Professor Leo Strauss said and told his students, Plato had two messages. He had one message for the common students. He had another message for the elite students. Because in every generation, there are a certain number of very outstanding elite people who are told the secret and are introduced to the mysteries. And the mysteries have existed since the beginning of recorded time and continue being promoted throughout the world today. Now, to understand the mysteries, you have to know a little bit about the, that time. Uh, Plato's writing about uh, 365, 375 BC. Uh, Pythagoras, Pythagoras had lived between 585 and 495 BC. He was the first in the great Greek philosophers. And he traveled to the Mideast, or to the Near East, and studied the mystery religions, returned to Greece, and set up a school where the mystery religions were taught and where the secrets were revealed only to the very elite students. Now, most of you may have heard of the Pythagorean dictum. You probably learned it when you took uh, geometry. And that is the fact that A square plus B square is equal to C square. The square root of the two sides of a right-angled triangle, the sum of the square root of the two sides of a right-angled triangle, is equivalent to the square root of the hypotenuse of the right-angled triangle. This is seminal to an understanding of geometry. Have any of you ever wondered how Pythagoras came up with that conclusion? Do you honestly think Pythagoras sat down and said, you know, I've been thinking. I think that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Where did he get this idea? He had tapped into the hidden knowledge. And there is hidden knowledge. Have you ever wondered how the great pyramids were, were built? Have you ever wondered the, the marvels of the world, the, the Colossus of Rhodes? Have you ever, ever seen uh, depictions of what this was, the Temple of Zeus? The magnificent architecture that existed long before man had the capacity to build these things using normal human intelligence? Where did the knowledge come from? Well, about two generations after Pythagoras established his school for teaching the mysteries uh, in Greece, along comes Socrates. Socrates lived from 469 to 399 BC. Incidentally, all of this is in a syllabus we have in the back there because we hope you will get the information and begin studying it. Socrates' student was Plato, who lived from 428 to 347 BC. And Plato, uh, then, of course, had a student, Aristotle. And Aristotle had a student named Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great set out to conquer the world and to fulfill this idea of creating the, this perfect utopian society. 
And Alexander the Great with a very, very small force of Macedonia, and some people say as few as, oh, 35,000, took on the greatest armies in the world. And one of the greatest military defeats of all time, he challenged Darius, who was the emperor of Persia, uh, with hundreds of thousands of men, perhaps as many as a million men, uh, and uh, you know, squadrons of, of elephants, and here's these 35,000 little Macedonians who conquer Darius and allows, of course, Alexander to move into the Near East and the Middle East into Afghanistan. Did you ever wonder how he did it? I mean, do you think he was really that much of a military genius, or was there an X factor that most people have never heard of? Well, it's very, very rare that you will find people ever mentioning the secret of the mysteries. However, the, we came across a book. It was written probably in the first century AD. It was written by Plutarch. The book is called Plutarch, the Age of Alexander. I have a copy. You can still get it. It's in print. On page 259, they talk about Alexander and the mysteries. And let me read you what he said. It seems clear that Alexander was instructed by his teacher not only in the principles of ethics and politics, but also in those secrets and more esoteric studies which philosophers do not impart to the general run of students, but only by word of mouth to a select circle of the initiated. Some years later, Alexander had crossed into Asia, and he learned that Aristotle had published some treatises dealing with these esoteric matters. And he wrote to him blunt language and took him to task for the sake of the prestige of philosophy. And this was the text of his letter. Alexander to Aristotle, greetings. You have not done well to write down and publish these doctrines you taught me by word of mouth. What advantage shall I have over other men if these theories in which I have been trained are to be made common property? I would rather excel the rest of mankind in my knowledge of what is best rather than the extent of my power. Farewell. Now then, Aristotle responded to Alexander, and he said, you know, he pointed out that the so-called oral doctrines, and that is the oral doctrines of the mysteries and of the secret religions, were in a sense both published and not published. For example, it's true that this treatise on metaphysics is written in a style which makes it useless for those who wish to study or teach the subject from the beginning. The book serves simply as a memorandum for those who have already been taught its general principles. The mysteries tell the secret and tell how you can tap into the hidden power. But this was not to be known by the common people. And this was exactly what Louis Strauss was telling uh, his students back there at, George, at the University of Chicago. You see, I mean, there was one message, you know, for the, for the average student, but there was another message for the elite, for those people then who would come to rule the world. And you will find very, very few references to the mystery religions, you know, if you peruse literature. Uh, we have actually gotten something here, that, and uh, if you want a copy of this, we'll be glad to give it to you. Uh, it's from a book that was written in 1840, and it tells about uh, a man named Citizen Genet, who was a member of the Illuminati, he was Jacobin. He was the American ambassador, pardon me, the uh, French ambassador to, um, to uh, the United States in the 1790s. And he was, he was actually, uh, had managed to irritate our, our authorities by interfering in American policies. And there was an effort at that time to centralize power in Washington, D.C. He was opposing our policies, and he was a Frenchman. He was the French ambassador to America. And so Washington had Thomas Jefferson I'll write him a letter and tell him that they were going to get him recalled. And this is what Citizen Genet wrote. You will never see this any other place. Uh, we, have, we found in my own library a copy of this book written in 1840. So we've made a copy for you. Whatever, sir, writes Genet, may be the result of the exploit of which you have rendered yourself the generous instrument after having made me believe you were my friend, after having initiated me in the mysteries which had influenced my hatred against all who aspire to absolute power. There is an act of justice which the American people, which the French people, which all free people are interested in demanding. 
So Thomas Jefferson had inducted Citizen Genet, who was an illuminist, into the mysteries. And of course, if you read my material, we tell you what Jefferson eventually did, eventually did where he writes about how he had eventually turned away from this. And you'll find that in some of the, in my newsletter, which is included in the syllabus. But, and then, of course, if you read the writings of Albert Pike, in his 1871 treatise, Morals and Dogma, you'll find frequent references to the mysteries. And if you try to read that book, which is really the, uh, almost the Bible of modern day masonry, you can't understand it unless you know the secret. And once you know the secret, it's all so obvious. In fact, once you know the secret, you see it every day, but you don't recognize it because nobody has ever told you. So let's take you back in time, really to where this really all began. After the great flood that inundated the earth during the time of Noah, after that, uh, a great warrior named Nimrod set out to create a one world society under his control. And he set out to build a tower in Babylon that would be so high that if God ever tried to interfere with the affairs of men again, uh, that they'd be able to climb to the top of the tower and they'd have nothing to worry about. But of course, God intervened, and the tower was never completed. If you go to Strasbourg today, you will find a replica of the incomplete Tower of Babylon. It is where the European Union meets on a weekly basis. Why did they create a replica of the incomplete Tower of Babylon? Because that's what the European Union is all about. It is about the reconstitution of Nimrod's ancient plan and of basically of creating a one world government under a ruling elite. And the European Union is simply a segment of this plan. The plan is much larger than the European Union. Because there's to be an American Union, Mexico, United States, Canada, a South American Union, an African Union, an Asian Union, or a so-called ASEAN Union, uh, the, an Arab, a Union of the Arab States. And when all of these countries have given up their national sovereignty into trade blocks, then to unite them into a one world government with a one world currency, a one world ruler, and a one world religion. That's what it's all about. That's what the mystery is all about. But why are they doing it? And what energizes them? And what gives them the tremendous power that they have? Well, of course, you can, after the destruction of Nimrod's empire, people began moving other places. And you see the, the evidence of the tremendous knowledge that they had acquired in the, the Temple of Giza, the Great Pyramid of, in Egypt. And people will tell you, oh, this was the Pharaoh's tomb. But knowledgeable people will tell you, no, it was a center of worship. It's perfectly aligned north, south, east, and west. How were they able to align that at that time? How were they actually able to move those gigantic stones into place? And the perfect symmetry of that, four or 5,000 years ago, probably 5,000 years ago, and of course, Stonehenge. If you go to Stonehenge today, you'll find out that on, uh, on the very day of the spring equinox, if you stand before the, one of the vertical stones there and you look out through one of the trilithons, the sun comes up and sits right on top of, of this, this vertical stone there in front of the altar. Where did they get the knowledge to do that? If you go to South America, you'll find the pyramids there all aligned in the same order, the Mayan and Inca pyramids. Where did the knowledge come from? And what was this really all about? Well, in about 600 BC, the Jews were captured and, and taken to Babylon. And the Jewish nation was transported there. The uh, city of Jerusalem was destroyed. And, and when the Jews were living in Babylon, why the rabbis then were introduced to the mystery religions. And it was at that point that the Kabbalah was created, the Jewish Kabbalah which is still being taught today. The Kabbalah is still being invited. You find Madonna and, uh, and Rosie O'Donnell and, uh, and many of them, they're studying the Kabbalah, but they have no idea what they're into. Unless you really have specific instruction, you cannot understand what this is about. 
in 3 BC why the Magi left the east to travel uh, to Bethlehem because it was written in the ancient records that the, the Christ would be born in Bethlehem at that time. And that's why they came. It's a long way, believe me. It's not something you just climb on your camel and, uh, you know, you're there the next day. A long, long, difficult trip uh, from Persia. And yet we're told the story of the three wise men who came uh, in search of the, of the Savior, Christ Jesus the Lord. In about the first century after the birth of Christ, uh, there was a Christian heresy. It was known as Gnosticism, which was really a Christian type of the Kabbalah. And then, of course, you find all throughout history this continuity of the mystery religions and of the secret. The secret, but most people have no idea what it's about. Certainly, this is what motivated the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar were founded as a order of the Catholic Church in 118. Uh, and they were actually created on Temple Square, but the, their goal was really not, as they were supposed to be, to guard the pilgrims. They were there to gain the secret knowledge and the power that went with it. And of course the Knights Templar then persisted in the Holy Land until the defeat of the Crusades, and then they moved to Europe where they became the most powerful force in Europe, all during the 1200s. And they persisted as the major force, the first international bankers in Europe, until Friday, the 13th of October, 1307, when the leader of, of, the, uh, of the Templars, a man named Jacques de Molay, was arrested for heresy and was eventually burned at the stake. All across America today, you have de Molay clubs. Young boys entering de Molay. Isn't it fun? I'm a member of the de, de, de Molay. They have no idea who Jacques de Molay was or why he was burned at the stake. Why he was arrested. Why Friday the 13th is supposedly a, a day with an evil omen. But there's so much of what goes on today we really don't understand. In the 1400s came the Rosicrucians. And they were simply another organization that had tapped into the secret knowledge. And we have on the back table probably one of the most important DVDs ever made. I did not make it. It's called The Secret Mysteries of America's Beginnings. If you have not seen it, you need to. It actually won the New York Film Festival Award for Best Documentary last year, put together by a friend of mine, financed by another friend. I play a small part in it, you know, about 30 seconds or so. But it is almost a three-hour documentary about the influence of Rosicrucianism in Elizabethan England, and that, of course, as the movement spread to the United States and began to dominate politics here shortly after the pilgrims arrived on our shores, as the Christians came to this country uh, to create a nation where people could be free under God. These people came to America to create a nation that would be under the control of those who understood the mysteries. Uh, it talks about how, of course, these people within the secret societies were involved with British intelligence in Elizabeth, England, you know, in the late 1500s. And how a man, uh, Mr. Dr. D, who was the leader of the Rosicrucians, and a member of British intelligence always used to sign his name, 007. And, of course, that's where Ian Fleming got the idea for James Bond, 007. You remember that? When you begin to understand how this really all ties together, but most people are never going to be told, because, of course, you are not considered part of this elite and only there to understand what's really going on. Well, of course, these secret societies came from Great Britain to America, the Rosicrucians, and began to undermine the very fabric of our society. Uh, the Masons were established in 1717, arrived in America about 1730, and by 1740, America, this wonderful Christian nation that had been established by our founding fathers, the Pilgrims, the Puritans, and, the, and certainly the uh, uh, various groups that had come here, the Quakers and the Congregationalists, had become a totally depraved nation. And much of the sexual excess and immorality that uh, exists today was in America in 1740. And then came a couple of evangelists, a man named Jonathan Edwards, a man named John Wesley, and they carried out a great religious crusade, 
And they changed the direction of this nation in 1740, the first great awakening. And suddenly everything changed and people began turning back to God and men began to fear God. And men realized, of course, the truth of the gospel. And, and it was out of that first great awakening that came this desire for a nation where men could be free and could break away from the, uh, from the traditions of being ruled by a king and these ideas of individual freedom and led uh, initially, of course, to the a revolutionary war and the Declaration of Independence and our Constitution. But at the same time that the Christians were working to create a nation that could be free, the occultists were here working so that one day they would be able to control this nation and use the wealth and power of the United States to bring about a new world order and a new world religion. In 1776, two events occurred. In May, a secret society was created in Bavaria called the Illuminati. Now the Illuminati, contrary to what most people do believe, w was really uh, a continuation of the ancient mysteries. And I hope every one of you will want to get the book written by James H. Billington, the Librarian of Congress, the book called Fire in the Minds of Men. Because James H. Billington lays it out Almost the whole story, almost, I say. He's not going to tell you about the influence in America because he's part of the influence in America. He's part of the elite that rules this country, but he tells you what happened in Europe. And if you read the book with that knowledge, that James H. Billington is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the hierarchy that runs that organization, and he is withholding any reference to what's going on in America because if he wants to maintain his position as Librarian of Congress, if he wants to maintain his position of prestige, he dare not tell you common folks too much. But he tells you enough to make this his book, Fire in the Minds of the Men, one of the five most important books in my library. Because this is what he tells you, that contrary to what everyone believes, the continuing world revolution that began with the French Revol Revolution had nothing to do with the period of the Enlightenment and Rousseau and Voltaire. The world revolution began when the aristocrats, not the common people, but when the aristocrats took their lighted candles and moved them from the, the Christian altars, uh, moved them actually onto the occult and Masonic altars. And that this whole revolution is based upon the occult and upon secret societies, and people who are fascinated in secret societies, and he names all of these secret societies, and then societies that most of you have never heard of, like Bunarati, uh, the name doesn't mean anything to you, or the League of the Just, they were the ones who financed Karl Marx, and so much of what's gone on can be tied into the secret societies that dominated Europe, and the Illuminati was primarily responsible through their front group, the Jacobins, for the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror, and hundreds of thousands of people were slaughtered there, and the series of revolutions that followed. And of course, and he ends his book with the, no, not with the First World War, the Second World War. He ends his book with the revolution that took place in 1959 and the revolution in Cuba. But believe me, it continues since that time. The book is important. It's important you understand. This is a continuing revolution. Well, let's go back. The Illuminati was simply another example of an organization, a secret conspiratorial organization built upon the mysteries, uh, but having all of this, all of this mystique about it. it. It would intrigue people. Everybody loves a secret. And you were told, you know, as you get into the organization, you're going to get more information, but you've got to get to a higher level. And then you've got to get to a higher level to really get the secret. And then when you think you're almost there, why they tell you there are still higher levels where the real information, the secrets, become available. So that, of course, is so true of all of the secret societies, and that's what's true about masonry today. The trouble is the average mason has no idea what masonry is about. And the average person who's involved with uh, the Rosicrucians today, and the person who's involved with the Theosophists today, and the people who are involved with the Lucius Trust today, and the world group of new, world, new group of world servers, and the myriad of secret societies that do exist, have no idea what this is really all about. But there is a secret, and I'm going to tell you that, 
and I'm going to tell you the secret tonight. Now, it was in 1782 that Congress approved the Great Seal of the United States. It was originally, of course, designed uh, uh, by uh, Jefferson and Franklin, but uh, the Congress didn't like their, their plan, and so they had a couple of other committees, and eventually they came up uh, with the emblem that was back in the back of the Great Seal of the United States. It wasn't on the front. The back of the, uh, uh, the Great Seal of the United States, they hid this emblem that you'll see here. In 1935, it, it was brought out and put on the back of the dollar bill. Now, uh, the original one that was laid out by Jefferson and Franklin contained the eye. What is that eye? What does it represent? Well, we have an interview with Professor Carol Quigley. Remember, I don't know how many of you know who Professor Quigley was, but Professor Quigley was Bill Clinton's mentor, who wrote one of the most important books, one of the five most important books in my library. And believe me, we probably have 20 to 30,000 books there. But the, the book Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, was a book, of course, that inspired Bill Clinton, to explain to Bill Clinton who runs the world. The book is so important that actually uh, the British Library uh, uh, the British Mu Library at the British Museum didn't even list the book. They had it, but you couldn't get it when I was there, in, uh, I guess, in 1980, and, and I was able to get into the stacks. Uh, the book was actively suppressed for many years, and we have an interview with Professor Quigley where he tells you the story of how his book was suppressed. We do carry the book now. That's truly miraculous how we were able to get it, but we have the book, and it is available through our ministry, Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, but in the taped interview, which we'll, you'll hear, and it's in our four-tape set on the secret government, you'll hear Professor Quig t Quigley talking about this emblem, which was placed on the back of the Great Seal of the United States in 1782, and then on the back of the dollar bill in 1935. And Professor Quigley, of course, had total disdain for people like you. He referred to you as the petty bourgeois who voted for Barry Goldwater. And he used that term many times in his book. I mean, he was an elitist. Uh, he was a brilliant individual. I feel like I, I know him. I spent many weeks going through his papers and reading his books and, um, you know, and uh, talking with his wife and his mistress and all, all the various people who were intimate with his life. And he ended up a pathetic old man. He had actually uncovered the greatest secret of all time and and he missed it because he didn't understand God and he didn't understand that we were involved in a spiritual battle. Had he, why he could have certainly had such a profound impact on the lives of many people. And he ended up, of course, uh, having a, an adulterous affair with a, uh, with a very young girl. A, 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 one of many adulterous affairs, I might add. Under many circumstances, why Professor Quigley, in the tape we have with him, talks about this emblem which occurred on the back, placed on the back of the great seal of the United States and then on the back of the dollar bill. And he said, you know, why these right wingers come to me? And they tell me that that is the emblem of the Illuminati. Why that isn't the emblem of the Illuminati? That emblem has been around for 6,000 years. And he's absolutely right. That emblem, that eye, glorified eye in the triangle has been around for 6,000 years. And what this really is, if you look at it very closely, you notice that the, the capstone of the pyramid is, is hovering over the top of the pyramid. And what it really denotes is that it is an incomplete pyramid. Only when it is completed will the capstone settle into place. When the novo or doro seclorum has been fulfilled at that point, of course, uh, then, of course, we will have the fulfillment of the ancient plan that has been passed down through the millennia, the plan that Plato referred to and Alexander the Great referred to, and yes, even George Bush refers to uh, many, many times in his speeches, and you hear his speeches, but you don't understand them. In fact, in his second inaugural address, George Bush talks about, in the second to the last paragraph, and we've actually reproduced the inaugural addresses here, so you'll have them at your fingertips, and you can actually check them out. He talks about, you know, um, when our founders declared a new order of the ages. 
when our soldiers fell row after row in pursuit of a union based on liberty, when our, our people marched in righteous indignation beneath the banner of freedom now, they were acting on an ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled. When I, now, first of all, George Bush doesn't write his speeches. I mean, George Bush would be incapable of writing those lines. But Michael Gerson was his chief, uh, um, his, uh, chief speech writer. Uh, Michael Gerson, of course, is a brilliant man and, of course, cleared all of these speeches. Where do you think Michael Gerson went to work after he left the White House? Council on Foreign Relations. He's a fellow there. Uh, there's just this little club of very elite. If you understand esoteric writing, what you do is you try to confuse so the common people like you will not understand what's said. So you take an idea and you put it at the beginning and the end of the sentence and then you intersperse all sorts of uh, you know, things in the middle to confuse common people like you. What the real phrase was, what our founders declared a new order of the ages. They were acting on an ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled. What's the ancient hope? The new order of the ages. What's the new order of the ages? You go up on the internet, you type in new order of the ages, Google it in, and what do you come up with? Novo or Doro Seclorum, the new secular order. That's what it was all about. And that's what George Bush is talking about. And you read his speeches, they're magnificent. Trouble is you hear them and you have no idea what he's saying because nobody's going to interpret them for you. Well, anyway, they put this emblem on the back of the dollar bill. They hid it there. They understood what it was all about. You just were never to know. In 1791, they laid out the Masonic plan. And really, it, it was, had to do with astrology, the, the plan, the design of Washington, D.C. The occultists were here. They lay out the line, the plan for Washington, D.C. If you go to Washington, D.C. today, there are 23 or more zodiacs, astrological zodiacs, uh, depicted there in our major government buildings. What are the signs of this zodiac doing there? You'll find over a thousand figures that come from the zodiac and from the ancient Greek gods. What are they all doing there? And it all goes back to these ancient times and tapping into the mystery of religions. And of course, there's a new video that'll be coming out here within a month or two, etched in stone. But that's another story, and maybe we can tell you about that later as soon as it's available. But you see, there have been the two forces in America. One was the Christian. The other was the occult, and they do not want you to understand that the occult is in total working control of America today, and that is why we're at war in the Middle East. The war there has nothing to do with, with terrorism. It has everything to do with establishing a new order. In fact, if you remember uh, on the 10th of January of 2007, uh, President Bush addressed the nation. And, and he, this was the surge speech, where he was going to tell you what his plan was. He wasn't going to increase the number of troops. He was going to surge the number of troops in, uh, in, in uh, Iraq. But he made this statement. The campaign playing out in the greater Middle East is more than a military conflict. It is the decisive ideological struggle of our time. The campaign playing out in the greater Middle East is more than a, than a military conflict. It is the decisive ideological struggle of our time. Twelve days later, he gave a State of the Union speech. That was on the 22nd of January, 2007. And you'll find the text of that in the syllabus as well. And what did he say? Referring to the battle in the Middle East, it is the decisive ideological struggle of our time. I thought it was a military struggle. No, it's much more than a military conflict. What is it all about? It is part of the continuing world revolution. It is part of the move to bring about World War III and ultimately then the one world order and the new world religion. Well, uh, of course, by 1839, America was a depraved nation once again. Sexual immorality, I mean, uh, dishonesty, the people of this country had turned their back on God, and, and then came the Second Great Awakening. And there was a dramatic change, and of course, people turned back to God that second time. And it was led, the Second Awakening was led by Charles Finney and a group of ministers who were trying to awaken people, and you cannot be free, you know, if you don't 
uh, if you're not ruled by God. This idea that if we can only have freedom and people can do whatever they want to leads to, leads to moral anarchy. Freedom is not the ability to do what you want to do. Freedom is the ability to do what you should do according to God's commandments and God's rules. And the only people who can be free are those that are ruled by God individually, not through the format of government. We don't want a theocracy or an ayatollah sitting in the White House telling us what to do. As James John Adams had said, our, our form of government was made for a moral and religious people. It would not suffice for any other. You could not have a limited government and immoral people. If you have immoral people, you're going to have to have a tyrant to rule over them. Said me, it was William Penn who said, that those who will not be ruled by God will be ruled by tyrants. And that's the direction we're headed today. There's increased lawlessness and violence all across America. Today we have more people in our prisons per 100,000 than they have in communist China or in any nation in the world today. We have well over 2 million people in prison today. One of every three young black men is either in prison on parole or probation. And the whites aren't too far behind it. And remember that when liberty leads to a loss of order, then the demand for order will lead to a loss of liberty. When liberty leads to a loss of order, then the demand for order will lead to a loss of liberty. And if we don't get back to a moral foundation in this country, then America as a free society is lost. And it will be simply a remembrance of things past, like yesterday's sunset. But you see, it is not the first time it happened. It happened in the 1840s and, and in the 1740s. Well, we missed the 1940s. We did not have a, another great awakening at that time, and we really needed to have had one. In fact, it was in the years that followed uh, that, of course, the Supreme Court, packed with Masons, nobody will ever tell you that the Masons control the U.S. Supreme Court from 1941 to 1971, and because it is the purpose of Masonry to destroy the Christian foundation of this nation, they took God and prayer out of our schools because they control the Supreme Court in majorities of five to four to seven to, uh, to eight to one. And none of our religious leaders will tell you that because they're all afraid to speak out against Masonry. And yet masonry is the demonic force working at the highest levels of our nation today. Not the only one, because there are many of these demonic forces, but they're there and they're working intent upon destroying the very soul of America. In 1848, of course, we had Karl Marx writing the Communist Manifesto. But Karl Marx, of course, was simply acting as an agent for a secret society known as the League of the Just. But you're not going to learn that in school today or your universities. And you're not to know about the secret societies. In 1870, why Cecil Rhodes attended a, a lectures at Oxford University and heard a man named John Ruskin, who was the devotee of Plato, who read Plato every day. And John Ruskin gave a series of talks that inspired a whole generation of the aristocracy of Great Britain, that it was their obligation to give their lives to create a one world government. It was the white man's burden, the white man's obligation to unite the world under Great Britain. And Cecil Rhodes gave the whole of his life to that goal. The following year, of course, Albert Pike wrote Morals and Dogma. If you haven't read it, you need to get a copy. Four years later, this woman, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky created the Theosophical Society, which is, of course, the parent of the New Age movement that has millions of adherents in America today. And you will not find any town in this country of any size that does not have a metaphysical bookstore, in fact, many of them, where they are preaching the Gospels that Helena Petrovna Blavatsky advocated back in 1875 when she created the Theosophical Society. And they have branches in Ohio, not too far from here, Wheaton, Illinois. Branches all across America and many front organizations like the Lucius Trust that has front organizations like the new group of world servers that is itself financed by some of the wealthiest and most powerful foundations in the United States today. And of course, the Lucius Trust used to be known as the Lucifer Publishing House. Well, then of course, America went into a series of wars. We fought the First World War and the Second World War. We went into a no-win war in Korea, a no-win war in Vietnam. We never went to Vietnam to win the war. We financed the North Vietnamese all during the war. We financed the Russians who financed the North Vietnamese 
who financed the South Vietnamese Viet Cong that were killing our boys, just as today we're financing the Pakistanis. They were funding the Pakistani intelligence that's funding the Taliban who are killing our boys in Afghanistan. It's like deja vu all over again, but nobody wants to tell you that. And of course, the administration keeps saying, this is not Vietnam all over again. Of course it's Vietnam all over again. It's another no-win war. We've got the greatest fighting men in the world. They're just not allowed to win the war. And if you really believe that we're going to be able to solve this problem with the surge of 20,000 troops in Iraq, well, I hate to tell you this, but you're sadly mistaken. Then, of course, there was the first presidential inaugural address. And you really need to read this. In the closing part of President Bush's first inaugural address, which was on the 20th of January, 2001, this is what he said. After the Declaration of Independence was signed, Virginia statesman John Page wrote to Thomas Jefferson, we know the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Do you not think that an angel rides in the whirlwind and directs this, this storm? Much time has passed since Jefferson arrived for his inauguration. The years and changes accumulate. But the theme of this day, he would know, our nation's grand story of courage and its simple dream of dignity. This work continues. This story goes on. And an angel still rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm. Those are the concluding words of the first inaugural address. How many of you remember them? Nobody ever points them out to you. Who is the angel who rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm? If you go back and you read the Bible, it was the Lord who was in the whirlwind and directing the storm, not an angel. Who's the angel he's talking about? The elite understand, but you are not to understand. Well, on October 20, October of 2001, the United States attacked Afghanistan. We've been at war over five years in Afghanistan. Why did we go there? Why well, we went there to catch the wicked Osama bin Laden? And the president promised us we we're going to get him dead or alive. But we never tried to get him. They wouldn't let our forces go. We have a books written by people who were there at the time. I talked to people who were there at the time. Our forces wanted to. Our people could have gotten Osama bin Laden. The Bush administration would not let them do it because we needed an enemy to rally you common folks behind the government. After all, if there's not an enemy, how are we going to get the people to rally behind the government? In fact, Plato had written in the Republic, when the tyrant has defeated the enemy by conquest or treaty and there's nothing to fear from him, he's always rounding up a new enemy so he can rally the people behind himself. That's what it's all about, ladies and gentlemen. Bin Laden is, uh, was described in George Orwell's 1984. You know, he was the man, he was the enemy of Big Brother. And whenever they would flash his picture on the screen, everybody would cry out against an anger because he was the enemy of Big Brother. In March of 2003, United States forces attacked Iraq. Now, during the First World War, in three and a half years, we defeated uh, Germany. We've been at war, and uh, as, of the, as I give this uh, speech tonight, 47 months. We've been at war for 47 months in Iraq, and things go from bad to worse. Do you honestly think that our military is that incompetent? Of course not. They've never been allowed to win the war. They were never given enough troops. They were never given the right equipment. They were never allowed to go after the enemy. All they can do is fight and bleed and suffer and die, but never win the war. And then, of course, during the second inaugural address on the 20th of January, 2005, and I read it to you before, but I would like to read it to you again. President Bush, in the second to the last paragraph, made this statement. When our founders declared a new order of the ages, when soldiers died in wave upon wave for a union based on liberty, 
When citizens marched in peaceful outrage beneath the banner of freedom now, they were acting on an ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled. When our founders declared a new order of the ages, they were acting on an ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled. What is the ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled? The new order of the ages. And what is the new order of the ages? As we said before, it's the Novo Odoro Seclorum inscribed on the back of the great seal of the United States on the back of the dollar bill. It is an ancient occult emblem about the plan the plan that has been around since the inception of mankind. Now, I'm going to tell you how you can begin to understand what this is really all about. Remember earlier I told you about the parable of the cave. And, of course, the interpretation that most people have of the parable of the cave, the shadows become our reality, and that's what we believe. The shadows are projected by the people who control us. But there is another interpretation, because you see, uh, as Plato did, he always had two messages, one for the common people, like you, and, then, and me, and then another one for the elite. And of course, the real meaning of this is the fact that there are two dimensions to the world. There's the material world we live in, and then there is a spiritual dimension. Now, we catch glimpses of the spiritual dimension from time to time. That, then, is the shadows on the wall of the cave. We can't quite see the figures, but we know it's there. And we can catch little glimpses of it at times, as, as you will get, for instance, reading Plutarch's The Age of Alexander and the fact that Alexander was a student of the mysteries. And, uh, and of course, he had really tru truly supernatural power. I mean, who in their right mind would take an army of 35,000 Macedonians up against Darius, the mightiest army in the world at that time? And even more so, how was he able to defeat him? And so it, it is that there is a spiritual dimension to everything going on today. And as I have gotten in and studied the esoteric writings, and of course you can read them, and you can find them in, of course, Morals and Dogma, but there are literally thousands of books that are written by people who are devotees of the New Age indirectly back to Madame Blavatsky who founded the Theosophical Society in 1835. And you begin to understand that these people worship a different God. These people have a dualistic concept. And you remember we told you about, about Charles Dickens, it was the the best of times was the worst of times. It was the age of reason. It was the, the age of foolishness. It, there's a dualism here. And, and there are always two meanings to everything. There's the meaning that most people accept and then the true meaning. There is another dimension. If you tap into that dimension, you can obtain supernatural power. And that supernatural power allowed the ancient builders to build the Temple of Giza and the Colossus of Rhodes and uh, these marvelous things and to come up with so much uh, of the, the ideas, A square plus B square equals C square. Uh, the, the ancient mysteries, the ancient concepts, many of them carried forward, which we utilize in our everyday society. But they came from the other dimension. They did not come from the God that we worship. They came from his counterpart, the angel, who is Lucifer. The secret of the Kabbalah, out of the Gnostics, out of the Knights Templar, and of the Rosicrucians, and of the Illuminati, and of the upper echelons of masonry, of which most masons have no idea. But the fact is that there is another God, and that Satan is the God we should worship. Why? Why? Because he gives us all sorts of power. He makes no demands on us. There are no restrictions on what we do. I mean, after all, the God of the Bible, the God of the Bible has the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not do this. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's property. And, but Lucifer gives you total freedom. 
there are no restrictions on what you do. You can do whatever you want to. But the problem is, of course, it leads to moral anarchy, and it leads against the moral chaos. And as we said earlier, when liberty leads to a loss of order, then the demand for order leads to the loss of liberty. And these people are really waiting for the coming of the Antichrist to rule the world. And those of you who have not heard our interviews with Constance Comby, you need to get them, you need to get Constance's writing. She has talked to these people extensively, as I have as well, and these people are tapping into the power from the other side. I have a witch who had, I, we had a conversation with uh, through the email for a time, and, and she was furious with some of the things I said on a, on a nationwide television program called Unscrewed. Probably most of you don't watch Unscrewed, but millions of young people do. But uh, she said, you know, here, you, you mean you're saying all these bad things about we witches. Why, I, I'm a white witch. I'm a good witch. Oh, there's some black witches out there, but I'm a white witch. And I do good things, and we, we have our rites and our rituals and the conjure up our spells, but we're just trying to contact the beings from the other dimension. We're just trying to contact the beings from the other dimension. These are not imaginary. These are very real. There have been over 5,000 recorded alien abductions. Now, I don't believe that aliens come from from outer space or from other planets. I believe the demonic manifestations of this eternal spiritual battle that began in the Garden of Eden is being waged today. And their ultimate goal is to create a one world government under the control of Lucifer and the Antichrist and the false prophet because there is a trinity of evil. And just as in the Christian faith, there's God and the, fa the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So everything within the occult is a mirror image of the Christian faith. There is Satan, there is the Antichrist, there is the false prophet. The one thing that has convinced me more than anything else is the validity of the scriptures is because these people believe in the gospels, they believe in the Bible. They just hate everything that's there and they have chosen to worship a different God. And this is really what motivates people at the highest levels of our government. Who is the angel who rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm? And if you read the President Bush's first inaugural address, this is how he concludes it. Referring twice, not once, but twice to the angel who rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm, it's Lucifer. Now, whether George Bush understands this or not, I don't know. He is part of a Luciferian organization. If you don't know anything about Skull and Bones, you need to get my four tapes set on Skull and Bones. You need to get the new book we're carrying on satanic crimes because they've actually gotten in and, and gotten video cameras of the initiation at Skull and Bones. And as you know, both George Bush and his father and his grandfather and John Kerry, who ran against George Bush in 2004. They all come from Skull and Bones. And in the inauguration, they kneel before Lucifer. The book is, of course, Satanic Crimes, researched by a, uh, a very courageous young man named William H. Kennedy. And it's available through our ministry. Understand we're involved in a spiritual battle being fought on a political, ideological, and cultural battlefield. Today, there is a conscious, organized effort to destroy the sovereignty of our nation. It is part of a worldwide plan. It is being carried out in Europe with the formation of the European Union. It doesn't matter that the people of France and of the Netherlands have voted against the Constitution. They don't care what the people want, you common people. You're standing in the way of progress, this wonderful dream that they, they've been working for thousands of years to accomplish. Today, in North America, it's the American Union. The Commerce Department's rewriting our laws. They're planning on the transnational highway, and we have some beautiful pictures of that in the backs of the other the syllabuses back there. My secretary would only give me a black and white one, but you can see it in vivid color. The plan is the Security and Prosperity Partnership. There is a plan to do away with the sovereignty of our nation. That's the reason we're not guarding our borders. That's the reason that they've thrown a couple of our, uh, of our border patrolmen who are guarding our border. And, shot a, a drug smuggler uh, who they thought was going taking a shot at them. They shot him. Uh, they've sent them to jail for 10 years so that it will send a message to the people working on the border, don't you dare try to stop the invasion of America. And while our boys go overseas to fight for freedom in Iraq and Afghanistan, we're losing our freedom here at home. Governor Lamb 
And I don't ordinarily agree with Governor Lamb, but he has a wonderful treatise, and I just wanted to read it to you, Richard Lamb, former governor of Colorado, because on this I would agree with him totally, and this is what he wrote. If you think that America is too smug, too self-satisfied, too rich, then let's destroy America. It's not hard to do. No nation in history has survived the ravages of time. If I wanted to destroy America, I'd support the corrupt Mexican government and help them oppress the Mexican people. I'd cancel the Becerra program and block implementation of the guest worker program that Congress authorized in 1996. I'd assure illegal immigrants they wouldn't be punished or deported if they came to the United States. There'd never be enough border guards. The guards would be stationed in the wrong places, and I'd tell the Mexican authorities where the Minutemen volunteers were stationed. I'd block the use of electronic technology and aerial surveillance along the border. I, I would uh, apprehend only one in every four illegal immigrants who enter the U.S. And, and promptly release them, the catch and release program. I'd block the effort to build a fence along the border, and I would protect illegal immigrants living in the United States. Why, nobody would ever do anything like that, would they? What's happening today is not accidental. These people know exactly what they're doing. It's the a, a result of a long rains plan. Now that they have utilized America to destroy America, to destroy our sovereignty, to destroy the sovereignty of Canada and Mexico and the South American countries. They're using Hugo Chavez, who's playing his part very well. Hugo Chavez is a close friend of Fidel Castro, and everybody knows Fidel Castro is our wicked enemy, don't they? I mean, Fidel Castro is the enemy of the United States, but if that's really true. Why is it that when little Elian Gonzalez he survived an ordeal at sea, and his mother and everybody else on the raft with him was died trying to escape from Cuba, and Elian was brought to the United States and, and was living with his relatives, which the mother had wanted. Why Bill Clinton and Janet Reno sent a SWAT team, a heavily armed SWAT team with body armor and automatic weapons, 125 of them, to, to Miami, Florida to kidnap Elian and send him back to Fidel Castro. Why would they have done that if Fidel Castro is the enemy? Or maybe, just maybe, reality is usually scoffed at. Illusion is usually king. But you see, in the battle for survival of Christian civilization, it's going to be reality, not illusion or delusion that's going to determine what the future will bring. How do we understand what's going on today? Well. We have a number of powerful organizations that control our government. One of them is the Trilateral Commission, far more powerful than the Council on Foreign Relations, although it has most of the same people in it. After all, the David Rockefeller was the Vice President of the Council on Foreign Relations for 15 years, the President of the Council on Foreign Relations for 15 years, today is the Honorary the Chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations, but he organized the Trilateral Commission in 1973, and of course the first put First person they put in the presidency was Jimmy Carter, member of the Trilateral Commission. When Ronald Reagan went to the White House, who did he select for his vice president? But Trilateral Commission member George Herbert Walker Bush, who really ran things all during the Reagan administration, and then himself became president of the United States in 1988. And he was succeeded by Bill Clinton, who came from the Council on Foreign Relations, who was succeeded by George Bush, who was controlled by Dick Cheney, who came from the Trilateral Commission. Now, when you join government, you have to resign from the Trilateral Commission, but don't worry about Dick Cheney's seat in the Trilateral Commission. Who do you think got it? Lynn Cheney, my, the Cheney's wife, Dick Cheney's wife. In 1979, Barry Goldwater tried to warn the American people about the Trilateral Commission, what it was intended to be. And this comes from his book, With No Apologies, and it's important that you read it and understand it. He said this, the Trilateral Commission is intended to be the vehicle for multinational consolidation of the commercial and banking interests by seizing control of the political government of the United States. The Trilateral Commission is intended to be the vehicle for multinational consolidation of commercial and banking interests. He's talking about controlling the multinational, the financial and commercial interests of the world but first of all, to gain control of the government of the United States. 
And then they go on to say, in my view, the Trilateral Commission represents a skillful, coordinated effort to seize control and consolidate the four centers of power, political, monetary, intellectual, and ecclesiastical. That means religious. They're controlling the religions of America today. The Commission emphasizes the necessity of eliminating artificial barriers to world commerce. That's all these trade blocks they're creating. Tariffs, export duties, quotas. What it proposes to substitute is an international economy managed and controlled by international monetary groups through the mechanism of international conglomerate manufacturing and business enterprises. Freedom, spiritual, political, economic, is denied any importance in the trilateral construction of the next century. What the trilateral trilaterals truly intend is the creation of a worldwide economic power superior to the political governments of the nation states involved. They believe the abundant materialism they propose to create will overwhelm existing differences. As managers and creators of the system, they will rule the future. They plan on ruling the world. Certainly the most powerful man in the United States today, a most wealthy man is not Bill Gates nor Warren Buffett, it's David Rockefeller. If you read David Rockefeller's memoirs, which is available through my ministry in paperback now by popular demand, you will find out that uh, David Rockefeller's daughters are very good friends of Fidel Castro. Why would the daughters of the leading capitalists in the world be such good friends of the wicked Fidel Castro? Isn't he our enemy? Well, if you've not yet seen uh, my video, The World Revolution, you really need to get it, because you, there you'll see an interview I did with Ambassador Smith, Earl Smith, back in 1980. Ambassador Smith had been the ambassador to Cuba in 1959 when the United States brought Fidel Castro to power. And he will tell you, we knew Fidel Castro was a, a communist. We brought him to power. I was required to tell Batista he would leave Cuba the following day. Fidel Castro never won the revolution. He never won any major battles. He lost all the time. The Cuban people didn't want him. We installed him there. Another wonderful social experiment created by our invisible government. And, and you really should watch the uh, World Revolution. I think it's a very important uh, video because you'll actually see my uncut version of my interview with uh, Ambassador Smith uh, before he passed away. On page 405 of David Rockefeller's memoirs, he writes this. Some even believe we, the Rockefeller family, are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists, and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty, and I'm proud of it. Page 405. Why doesn't Russ Limbaugh ever tell us that? Or Sean Hannity, or Brian Williams? Why, ladies and gentlemen, they're the finest conservatives money could buy. You see, our reality is created by the people who control television and talk radio, and, and there's just a small voice out there, but a growing voice, a, a voice that really can have an impact. And with your help and with your prayers, why we can really have an impact. But understand that simply by acting alone, we can accomplish nothing. This is a spiritual battle, and we need your prayers because we will never defeat the spiritual forces aligned against us without the help of God Almighty. There are many exciting things that are happening today. Earlier, um, before uh, I came about, uh, Wendy uh, had introduced and mentioned Joyce Riley. Joyce Riley and I have a satellite hookup. You can listen to us 24 hours a day. Nine hours at Joyce Riley, nine hours at Stan Monteith on Telstar 5, if you'd like to. And it only costs you, I think, $169 for everything that you need to, to watch nine hours a day. Very soon, within six months, we'll be on Spodtronics, and you'll be able to listen to us on your cell phone. Now, you don't want to spend all your time. What you want to do is get other people to start listening to us on the cell phone. This will be available in the stream that we're giving to the satellite. 
you know, will be uh, available on cell phones across America, and we can begin to rival Howard Stern. <laughs> Ron Paul is going to be running for the presidency. I talked just the day before yesterday. I talked uh, uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday to his campaign manager. They're just trying to get uh, things organized so they can actually open an office. They're going to need money. They're going to need efforts. You can get your friends to listen to him every once a week. They have an 800 number, an 888 number. You can listen to every – we can get a message from him. But he's going to need money. He's going to need people putting in telephone calls. We need to begin organizing all across America because he's the one man in Washington, D.C. I trust. And then there is a growing awareness across America that something is seriously wrong. Alex Jones is doing a wonderful job reaching people. There are a number of communicasters and alternative radio. There are a number of websites, uh, uh, certainly Joe Farah's website is doing a great job. We're on that daily. News with Views, uh, Paul Walter's website. You need to go there. A million hits a day on that website. Five million hits a day on Joe Zaffaro's website. New websites going up. Raider's website put out by Tom Horn. We have a couple of his books back here on spiritual warfare and the gods of war that walk among us. People all across America are understanding the spiritual nature of the battle we're involved in and getting the message out. And you've got to help us. And you can help us. You can help us with prayer. You can help us with funding. You can help us with telling other people about the programs. But it's really up to you. So I wanted to end this program tonight by telling you a story. And it was told to me 44 years ago by a very good friend who had been a TWA airline pilot. And ordinarily, every year, they would take the TWA airline pilots back to a center and talk about accidents because you learn from an accident, and so it won't happen again. And this was the story about an accident that had occurred some time before, and uh, nobody could quite understand what had happened. Now, many of you may remember the TWA constellation. It sort of looked like a stork. It was, a, a, it was the first transatlantic plane designed by Howard Hughes, and it was the, the foundation of the TWA fleet for a long time. And it was a unique plane in the fact that the uh, there were stairs built in, and so you could open the door, and you could actually unfold the stairs, and you could then walk down the three uh, uh, tiers of stairs and get off the plane. Well, uh, this one morning, uh, one of the TWA constellations, uh, loaded with a full flight of fuel and a full contingent of passengers, taxied out on a runway for a takeoff. Pilot gunned the engine, got permission from... Uh, the tower to take off, started down the runway. And about two-thirds of the way down the runway, he realized he didn't have enough airspeed to take off. So he cut power, and the engine, the plane, instead of stopping immediately, skidded off the ends of the runway, catapulted across a ditch and came to lie in a field adjacent to, uh, to um, the, the runway. Well, then, of course, the emergency vehicles there at the airport all come out, the fire engines and the ambulances, and... And they come out and they run down the runway and they get the runway and there's a big ditch there and they can't get across. So then they've got to go back down the runway and out on the road and then into the fences to try to get to the field where this plane is just sitting there. Now, all they had to do was open the door and let down the stairs. Today, when there is a problem with a plane, What's the first thing that happens? As soon as the plane hits the, the, uh, comes to a stop, the doors fly open, the chutes come out, everybody runs in the chutes, goes down the chutes, they get out of the plane. But that wasn't standard operating procedure in that time. So everybody's sitting in the plane, looking out the windows, waiting for somebody to tell them what to do. Stewardesses don't know what to do. Passengers don't know what to do. Passengers see the fire engines coming and the and the ambulance is coming in. And then it so often happens when there's an accident of this sort, there was the loose wire, little gasoline leak, and suddenly before the horrified eyes of the onlookers, the plane went up in a sheet of flame, and everybody was incinerated. And all they had to do was open the door and walk out. And they were waiting for someone to tell them what to do. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's just the position we're in today, and I can tell you what to do. You've got to get involved. You've got to understand we're involved in a spiritual battle. And there is a God, and there is a devil. And you better be sure you're on the right terms with that God who's in heaven, because this is the only thing that's going to see you through the difficult times. No matter what happens, we're in for very, very difficult times. And you better have a personal relationship and understand there is another God out there, and there are other spiritual forces that want to claim your eternal soul. And you better get into the scriptures, and you better start studying it, because believe me, the other side knows the Bible a lot better than you do. They've just chosen to worship a different God. Get involved. Don't put it off. Because if you're not involved, who will be? And if not now, when? And so I would simply close with that favorite of my poems, compilation, combination of two. Back of all that foes have plotted, back at all that saints have planned, back of the schemes of men and demons is a higher hidden plan. Warp and woof are heaven created, every pattern good and wise, oft perplexed by earthly standard, but good and wise in heavenly eyes. Though the cause of evil prospers, yet his truth alone is strong. Though a portion be of the scaffold and upon the throne be wrong. But that scaffold sways the future, for in the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. Thank you. God bless you. Good night. Thank you all very much. All right, I guess guess we're going to take some uh, take some questions, and so I'm. Uh, if if you just uh, if you go to the microphone, if you have a question, and uh, just uh, state it loudly and clearly. And uh, yes, sir, what can uh, you talk about uh, the Pythagorean theorem? A square plus B square equals C square. And I hope you're implying that that equation was made from a previous technological civilization. Yes. And uh, that had just as much or more than we have. Absolutely. But it came from a different source. On Earth. On, on Earth. Absolutely. Okay. I want to say I have a book over there about, it's called The Internal Combustion Engine. It talks about why we don't have an electric car. We have the why we have the very inefficient uh, lead oxide battery. Edison made a nickel iron battery, and it wasn't allowed. It was half the weight of a lead oxide battery. It lasted twice as long. I'm sure there are lots of technology that we're not allowed to use. Oh, the, the battery energy, is the worst. The, the energy crisis is totally contrived. Thank that you, sir. That too, yes. Right. Dr. Stan, the rhetoric is building up towards our coming war with Iran. And of course, if we hit Could Iran... Could you step back just a little? Oh. It's, I just can't hear you if it's too loud. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, of course, the rhetoric is building up towards uh, the coming war with Iran. Yes. And of course, uh, if we hit Iran, the leftist countries in South America, Hugo Chavez, oh, there's about five countries that have formed a bloc and have formed an allegiance of mutual protection with Iran, so very likely if we hit them, there's going to be the, that's going to trigger other wars, Latin America, uh, Europe, I mean uh, Africa, and of course some of these oil producing countries may turn their sale of uh, oil instead of dollars to the euros. Uh, what, in your opinion, if if we hit Iran, are the social, economic, and political implications of that? All right, the question then is, what are the political implications if we go to war with Iran? First of all, all the indications are that we are going to war with Iran unless, and there is a possibility, and we're going to have to, we will know within the next several months, uh, there is, a, is an alternative plan, and that is to try to topple the government. Now, remember, the CIA toppled Premier Mossadegh in Iran in 1953 and brought the Shah to power toppled the Shah in 1979 and brought the Ayatollahs to power. The CIA is working in Iran today to overthrow the Ayatollahs. 
There's tremendous unrest there. Half the population is between about 15 and 24. They don't like the Ayatollahs. The Ayatollahs do not have the support of the people. Inflation is rampant. Unemployment is high. Uh, there, there's a tremendous unrest within the central part of the country and in the surrounding areas. They have a number of provinces like Azerbaijan and the, uh, Kurdistan and Kazakhstan. And, uh, and all of these people want to be free. So Iran has some very, very real problems. And I hope and pray that they will be able to, uh, you know, destabilize the country and topple it without going to war. But if we do go to war, the implications are frightening. Why? Why? Because we're not going to be able to simply go in there and, and knock out uh, a few of the nuclear sites. What we're going to do is inflame the entire Islamic world against us. You're absolutely right. Uh, the Iranians have developed some sort of relationship with the people in South America, and non-aggression plants, uh, um, uh, treaties with them. Uh, we, they have all sorts of, uh, Iran has all sorts of alliances with both Russia and China. This could be a prelude to World War III. Now, uh, whether this is going to occur now or a year or two or three from now, I don't know. Something is going to happen within the next three or four months, something major. It may be that they're going to delay World War III. It may be that they intend to have World War III now. God only knows the answer to that, that and the evil people that, of course, are aligned against the sources of freedom today. We're just going to have to wait and see. But believe me, if we do hit Iran, why you're going to see, of course, the price of oil go well over $100, $150 a barrel. You're going to see our whole economic structure here in this country begin to crumble. You're going to be see our relationships with South America cut off and Venezuela will cut us off from oil. We may very well end up going to war with both South Korea, pardon me, with North Korea and with Venezuela. We don't have the troops for that. What my concern is we would get involved in a nuclear holocaust uh, and we would be the only alternative we would have with the use of nuclear weapons. And if you think that we're going to be able to use nuclear weapons in other countries without having retaliation here, why, I think you're sadly mistaken. I know you, you, you realize the implications. I share your concern. We are on the verge of something big. We will know within the next three months anyway, whether we're going to war or whether we're going to topple the government. But I believe the war is being planned. And I will tell you why the war is being planned. Because we're being programmed to hate the Muslims. And the Muslims are being programmed to hate us. The Muslim faith is a satanic religion. Muhammad was satanically possessed. And we have a wonderful four-tape set. Uh, my interviews with Craig Wynn, who spent 14,000 hours researching the Muslim faith. And he has all the references to the Hadith, hadith and, the, and the Quran and the Shira and all of these things that talk about, you know, the, the demonic element within the Muslim faith. But 10 years ago, we never heard about these things. Our attention is being focused on this today in preparation for a war with the Muslim world. And heaven help us if we get into that. Last question real quick. Is Almanijad from Iran a CIA agent provocateur just like bin Laden, the Ayatollah Khomeini, <laughs> and Saddam Hussein were? You're speaking of Ahmadinejad? Yes, exactly. Well, all I can say is that my impression is I see President Ahmadinejad is that, that he came from central casting someplace. Good evening, well, you know, there, there was, a, um, th there was a, a series that ran for many years, a television series called The X-Files, uh, with, uh, with Mulder and uh, here. I don't know how many of you remember The X-Files, but uh, you can still see them at times. And I remember one of the, one of the scenes where uh, Mulder was talking to this fellow from the CIA. And the fellow from the CIA is saying, you don't understand. I mean, you think that Saddam Hussein's real? Why, why, he was an actor in Hoboken, and we taught him Arabic and sent him over there. And, of course, I don't believe that's true. But he did work for the CIA. Saddam was a, a member of a CIA assassination team in 1959, always under uh, CIA domination. We carry a book through our ministry called uh, See No Evil. It's written by a CIA agent, Robert Baird. In fact, it was Robert Baird. It, it, that, that book was the background for, for George Clooney's movie, Seriana. And, and in that book, Robert Baer says he never met an Iraqi who did not believe uh, that the CIA was keeping Saddam Hussein in power. And some people thought he was still working for the CIA. It's a fascinating book. We recommend it. 
Okay. Yes. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, yes. I have a question for you. Um, do you believe that if Ron Paul does uh, make a successful run for the uh, office of the White House, that he'll be able to see the difference of the corporation operating as the United States? Uh, will he stand on that, do you think, or will he have the guts and the and the uh, gall to, to look at taking this back to a form of republic, form of government, instead of the democracy that we stand in now? Ron Paul is an amazing human being. He's known in Washington, D.C. as Dr. No. Very often the vote in Congress will be 434 to 1. You can imagine who the 1 is. Ron Paul tells the story of when Ronald Reagan came into the presidency. He made a deal with the Democrats uh, that he would deliver every Republican vote for the budget, which was actually to increase spending and to increase the side of government. That was the first budget that Ronald Reagan was to pass. And he made a deal uh, with the Democrats uh, that he would deliver every Republican vote if they would vote for the tax cut, which the, the Democrats were willing to do. He lined up every Republican in, in the House of Representatives except for Ron Paul. So Ron Paul was called to the White House by Ronald Reagan, who said, Ron, don't you believe in me? Why are you going to vote against us? I've given my word. Don't you believe in what I stand for? And, and Ron Paul said, Mr. President, I believe in everything you stand for. The trouble is, this legislation you want me to vote for is not what you stand for, and I will vote against it. He was the only Republican who voted against it. He's a man of integrity. In a world of equivocal men, we're lucky to have him there and just pray for his safety. And believe me, once he announces for his, pregnant, for his presidency, I hope every one of you will set up a prayer chain and ask God to protect him because, believe me, he will be a target. One, one last thing. Is the secret that you're talking about the universal law of attraction and the infinite source of supply? I'm sorry. Is the secret that you're talking about the universal source of attraction and the universal source of supply, the uh, law of attraction. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still to understand the, the, the secret. The, oh, the, the secret, universal the, the, law the, of attraction. Oh, the, no, the, the secret basically is that, that Lucifer is the real God. Lucifer is the good God, and the God we worship is the bad God. And if you tap into Lucifer, you will have tremendous power. And this is where the people get their power, and some of them actually have supernatural power. Have you seen the movie The Secret? Now I'll end it with that. No, okay. Have you seen it? No, I haven't. Oh, okay. But I'll look forward to it. That's really good. Um, thank you for coming uh, tonight, Dr. Monteith. Uh, my question is about um, this lady that uh, has written the, um, the uh, Harry Potter books. Uh, you know, I listen to the radio, and I don't hear anything about what this woman's about, what she stands for. Uh, those books have, have made a million dollars, all the kids, are, I mean a billion uh, um, plus, uh, and all the kids are turned on to them. And the thing, you know, what I just see is another um, uh, 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 H.G. Wells or just somebody who, uh, it makes me wonder if this woman was really set up um, um, by, you know, powers uh, behind the scenes to... Uh, craft these books and then push them out on to the, to the to the public, especially towards the youth. And the reason why it stays on my mind is because I, I listen to these people that are um, into uh, Wicca and witchcraft uh, over in Europe, and they seem to have uh, no fear, no remorse, and they really seem to uh, have... Um, uh, the perception that their religion is really uh, a religion that's um, embraced by the elite over in Europe. You know? Absolutely. It's just that they, they, uh, they're supposed to not, you know, proselytize. But this woman has, uh, I forget what her name is, but she's got over a billion dollars yes. that she can fund, you know, these people uh, go around and uh, 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 find uh, the type of... Uh, support network, develop this type of support networks, and you don't hear anything about it in the news, in the, and it just seems... It yeah, just, you're absolutely right. Of course, you wouldn't expect anything in the news because they don't want you to understand. The, the Harry Potter books were to introduce a whole generation of our youth to the supernatural and to make it attractive and fun and adventurous, and so many of our kids just love to be able to tap into that sort of power 
and many of our children are being drawn into witchcraft, into the supernatural. We have our, our motion pictures for the adults like The Medium. It's a wonderful story about a woman named Alison Dubois, Dubois who, who is a, uh, can actually tap into the other dimension. I don't know if you watch it. The truth is, there was an Alison Dubois who could tap into the other dimension, who worked with the district attorney, who caught the bad guys. There is another dimension out there, but you do not want to tap into it. We're introducing our people as far as, uh, into that as far as the Harry Potter books. Yes, it's pushing witchcraft. Witchcraft is the most rapidly growing religion in the world today. Uh, certainly the people, you know, in Europe, if you haven't read the book, The uh, uh, Satanic Crimes, you've got to get it, it gets into the Bilderbergers, how they're into pedophilia and human sacrifices and all sorts of terrible, terrible, terrible things. And you're not hearing a word of it here in America. Mm -hmm. in, in, in Europe, in Belgium, there was a march of 350,000 people marching against a, um, uh, a, a pedophile there who was tied into the Bilderberger groups. 350,000 people, mm -hmm. and uh, this tied into the Bilderbergers, not a word of it in American media. Yeah. People in Europe are incensed about this. Yeah. People in America don't even know anything's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody once said, you know, there's about 1% of the people who make things happen. There are 2 or 3% of the people who watch things happen, and the rest of the people don't even know anything's happening. Yeah. That's where we stand today. But you're absolutely right. The, the Harry Potter books uh, were truly demonic, and unfortunately, even some of our ministries said, well, see, they're really not bad. It's mm -hmm. teaching pr children to read, and what's wrong with reading? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were used in our schools. We're, we're losing a whole generation of our youth to yeah. the dark side, to the other dimension. And believe me, many of them are learning how to tap into the other dimension. Mm -hmm. Don't you ever do it, mm -hmm. because it'll take your eternal soul. Yes. God yes. bless, and thanks for the question. That's the public fool system. Right. Dr. Stan, we're on uh, live on the internet, as you know, and uh, Kevin from Pennsylvania would like to know if there's any other uh, people in Congress or the Senate that are worth supporting besides Ron Paul. Well, right now, I think we have to get behind one person. Ron Paul will be the man that I will back, and I hope everybody will. Uh, there, there's some other good people who are running, but we can only run for one. We'd, the f worst thing we could do would be divide, uh, divide our forces. And I've known Ron Paul for 44 years. I've followed his career. He's a man of integrity. He's a unique individual. And you will find out that on many of those other votes, where it's 434 to 1, the other good guys are voting the wrong way. Have another question. Yes, uh, and another uh, viewer wanted to know if you read Robert Novak's column today on, on uh, I think the name is L uh, Luntz or something, about a guy named Luntz. Uh, no, I didn't. I, I, I've been giving talks all day long or flying. <laughs> that was on Frank Luntz, so somebody, if that you know, has any significance, we might check that out. All right, thanks very much. Um, I forgot to ask you, um, I've heard, you, you, you were the gentleman that was in uh, Prudhoe Bay several years ago, weren't you? Or that must have been someone else that no, gave I, a talk. I don't know what you're speaking of. Well, Prudhoe Bay is where we have all the oil wells. Oh, you're, you're talking about uh, the, uh, the Gull Island and the massive oil deposits up there, yes. I've, I've checked that out with other people besides Lindsay Williams, right. Because I've heard the British have taken it over. And, all, and we're not getting any of the oil for us. That's why the oil prices are going up. Have you heard something like well, that? Well, no, basically what happened was the British Petroleum bought out Atlantic Richfield. It was an Atlantic Richfield strike, and, and BP bought uh, out Atlantic Richfield. Uh, but they've not really developed that yet. Uh, I mean, but you have to understand that the, there are five big oil companies. There used to be seven, now there are five. And British Petroleum is controlled by the British Crown. Shell Oil is controlled by the uh, Dutch Crown. And, of course, uh, our royal families are the Rockefellers. They control both Exxon and Chevron. And they so all we're getting together. oil from there still, yeah, huh? Yeah, yeah, we are getting the oil. We're, now, we're not getting you know, the, the offshore oil. We're getting that you know, in Prudhoe Bay, but we haven't got out to these great fields that are up there. If we were to tap into those, we would not need the oil from the Middle East. And they don't want to tap into it. That's the thing. They don't want a solution. They want the problem. And, of course, what people don't understand is there's so much oil in the world today that if they were not, did not have a cartel, the OPEC cartel, the price of oil would be $5 a gallon, or $5 a barrel. So they have to control production. You make more money when there's shortages. You make less money when there's abundance. Do you really think the oil companies want abundant oil? But we're burning up the atmosphere, too, aren't we? 
Well, I, 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 believe the glo I believe the global warming situation is a scam. And all I say is, if you really believe in global warming, why do we call Greenland Greenland? Why? Because in the year 1000, when, uh, when the Vikings were there, it was green and lush. And that was a period of global warming. And then we went into a period of global warming until about 1600. This global warming is a scam. Yes, I've heard that too. I've heard, the, yeah, the uh, Vikings actually went around Greenland at right. that about the 1000 sure. AD yeah, also. Right. So it must have been warmer. Right. Just one comment on oil. Uh, I can remember back when uh, diesel was uh, less expensive than regular gasoline, right. and now you can't even find it for less than the high-grade gasoline. And I wonder why that is. <laughs> yeah, I do too. You don't think it maybe has anything to do with them creating an artificial run-up of the price to make more money, do you? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's, not a chance. It's, you listen to, to Rush Limbaugh, he'll tell you it's all supply and demand. And, of course, if you listen to Rush, listen to Rush Limbaugh, why, of course, you, you will never understand what's going on in the world. Rush Limbaugh is the finest conservative money could buy. I, I hear you. I agree. Uh, what I really wanted to ask is, have you seen uh, the movie uh, A Long Kiss Goodnight? With, no, uh, no, I haven't. Sam, uh, I forget. It's I, I'm waiting for it to come out on DVD. It, 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 well, I have it on DVD. Oh, well, fine, and, but maybe. Uh, there's, a, there's a scene in there where uh, they bring out the point that the reason they're, they're, they're staging a whole terrorist activity like 9-11, but it's, a, you know, it's, it has to do with an oil tanker. And they say that uh, it comes out, the fact comes out that they're, the CIA is doing this so they can increase their funding. Sure. And uh, so if you haven't heard about that, you might want to check that out. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, there, there's a lot of, sometimes there's a lot more truth in some of the uh, Hollywood movies than, than you're, you're going to get from Rush Limbaugh. I agree. I agree. And, uh, and you, were, you were talking about the X-Files, and so I wanted to mention that. Right. And, and I also wanted to bring up the fact that, uh, about the Lone Gunman series. The what? The Lone Gunman series. Mm -hmm. You remember hearing about that? No. Or about eight or nine months before 9-11 happened? On the Lone Gunman series, which was done. By oh, the, the Lone gu the Lone Gunman. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. I saw the I saw that uh, presentation. For our listeners who don't know, uh, the the lo Lone Gunman were uh, sort of an offshoot of, of the X Files, and and the three Lone Gunmen were on this plane, and, and somebody was able to control the plane uh, by remote control, and the plane was heading towards New York, and where was it going to crash? It was going to crash into the World Trade Center, and you sat on the edge of your seat until just the closing seconds of the movie when they gained control of the, the controls of the plane. They were able to take it away from the evil people who were controlling it from the ground, and the plane soars over the top of the, of the um, World Trade Center, and you never saw it again. And they pulled the whole series off the That's air. That's right. <laughs> Dr. Stan, very briefly, um, I believe you had mentioned some time ago that something the major media didn't cover, uh, to no surprise, was the uh, decision for the Federal Reserve System to go to a cashless system yes. in October of 2005. In, in light of that, uh, how should we um, as individual families be uh, viewing the current uh, economic uh, conditions with regard to money in the bank that really there is no gold standard uh, obviously behind our money anymore? Uh, should we be investing in, in gold or other precious metals at this point in time to maybe, you know, hedge that uh, possibility? Yes. I believe that um, we have a talk on that. It's called the financial tsunami. I believe you should be in gold and silver and platinum. You should perhaps be in gold stocks and silver stocks and foreign currencies and foreign annuities. Uh, you get out of the dollar. That's a little different than the subject here, but it's a very legitimate question. I think we're heading into terrible financial times. If you listen to the President's State of the Union message, he will tell you that he, we have now uh, cut the budget deficit to $2.248 billion. And within a very short period of time, we will, have the, do, we will no longer be running a yearly a federal budget deficit. And uh, he's going to be able to do this. Uh, by continuing the tax cuts, uh, by uh, increasing spending, and how you can have tax cuts and increase spending and have a balanced budget, I don't know. Uh, but you have to understand it's a lie. Uh, if you'd like, um, 
Dr. Corsi has an excellent article on human events. You can call me and I'll send you a copy of this. The real budget deficit last year was not $248 billion, it was $4.7 trillion. $4.7 trillion on an actual basis. Congress requires them, the government to put out an honest set of books. They have the money in, the money out, or you have the sort of budget, uh, sort of actuarial figures that we require from corporations. And that's where you have to put on your liabilities as well, your health care, your pension, your other liabilities. Today, why General Motors has a liability of $55 billion. Ford has a, a, a liability of $22 billion. This is what they owe for health care that they are committed to pay and they don't have the money. Ford lost $12.7 billion last year, is borrowing $18 billion to try to stay afloat. But we have, well, in 1922, uh, pardon me, in, in the year 2002, and I'm taking this off the top of my head, but these are figures are pretty close. <clears throat> the, the yearly deficit from a sound actuarial uh, basis was $2 trillion. In the year 2003, it was $3 trillion. And in the year 2006, it was $4.7 trillion. Our real debt is about $57 trillion and increasing at such a rate that if we were to tax everything, 100% income tax and 100% corporate tax, we still couldn't meet the, the yearly, uh, yearly uh, deficits. Um, if you go up on the internet and type in Kitlikoff, K-I-T-L-I-K-O-F-F, St. Louis Federal Reserve, is America bankrupt? You'll get his article. Uh, he's a professor of economics. He wrote this report for the, the St. Louis Federal Reserve. The, the answer is yes, America is bankrupt. Get out of the dollar get out of annuities, get out of CDs, uh, buy something of intrinsic value, gold, silver, platinum, foreign currencies, the Swiss franc, diversify, diversify, diversify. If you can, uh, get my syllabus and my talk on the financial tsunami, and I think hopefully uh, it'll give you some good advice. I'm not a financial uh, a counselor, but I talk to a lot of smart people, a lot of people a lot smarter than I am. We're in real trouble financially, and most people are going to get wiped out. The whole idea is if you destroy the economy, then the people will turn to the dictatorship. Mm. Look to government to solve their problems and look after them. Mm. One last question, Dr. Stan. When um, I've heard reference of something called the corridor. Yes. Uh, what do you know about that? Well, we have the pictures of it. It's, it's in the syllabus here. That's the trans... Uh, North American corridor, it's a massive highway, four football fields wide that will extend uh, from the, the Mexican ports uh, in, on the west coast of Mexico all the way to Kansas City and up, up into Canada, it will divide our country. And it is going to be a vehicle by which they're going to be able to bring cheap goods into this country, flood our country with goods that are created in China, impoverish our people. And it is simply part of this whole idea of uniting the North American continent. It's part of this program for the North American Union. Uh, they, the one good thing is they were planning on this, completing it in 2005. It didn't work out. Now their target is 2010. Maybe if we pray, they'll be frustrated. It's all we can do because this is a spiritual battle. There are powerful forces that are intent upon destroying the sovereignty of our nation. Perhaps we, and it may be that God will allow this nation to be destroyed. I mean, if God is just, why uh, his justice will not sleep forever. But maybe, just maybe, we can have a third great awakening, and that's why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. Trying to bring out the spiritual aspect of it, hoping that people will return to our Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. God bless you.